I'm Dr. William Tuma. I'm an assistant professor of English at Essex County College. I am reading today from my uh, short story anthology, Shin's Shadow and Other Stories, uh, science fiction, all, uh, all science fiction. And I'm going to read today, this is Late Night Java. It was late. Sylvia knew that much. What time it happened to be, she had no idea. She did not wear a watch. It would not have made much sense. Hers would have told the time back on Earth. This was Trump rock. Days here were 36 hours long. Adjusting to the change had taken her two months. That was a year ago. The jungle's heat had been slightly broken by the rain. It had been a heavy fall that lasted into the night. But just because the storm had passed did not mean Sylvia had made it on dry. Streams of water continued coming down to the tall trees and a person walking through it would never know the difference. Sylvia having declined a jeep ride back had not anticipated on the moonless night. Her walk back took longer than usual and she made sure to take extra caution. There had been a postal delivery at the hospital for her. It was a package, plain with brown wrapping and her name printed on it. The last time she had received mail was three months ago, and that had just been a registered letter from her lawyer back on earth. Her house had sold, closed, and Sylvia's half got placed into her bank account. She chose not to write back. The hospital originally believed that she would be living on its modest grounds but Sylvia wanted nothing more than to have some solitude. That is just what she got. Home for her now was a small cabin about a mile from work. They had built it for Sylvia when nothing else could be found. It was carved from the bark of the respit, the largest tree on the planet. A small generator and water tank were installed, but no indoor plumbing. She had gotten over that in less than a week. When Sylvia walked through the door, her clock read 0400, dawn in three, she said, dropping her medical back to the floor. Two days without more than a cat nap was not unusual, but Sylvia had not figured on the time of year. The Kizi, one of Trumpra's more populous inhabitants, were going through their annual birthing period. Deliveries during the year were not uncommon for them, but each summer solstice brought in dozens, practically hundreds, of pregnant Kizi female ready to give birth. That day alone, Sylvia helped bring 10 babies into the world. Being tired quickly became a staple in her life after arriving on the planet, but she had asked for it. And if sleep did not happen for her that night, Sylvia would be back in action for another full shift, void of stamina. She sat down at the kitchen table, which was really her only table. In fact, with the exception of a mesh curtain separating her bed from everything else, her home was just one room. The package sat in her lap, heavier than she thought, but because it came unexpectedly, Sylvia was at a loss as to what could be in it. She undid the twine and broke the tape. It was filled with newspaper. A letter signed by her mother was on top of it all. Dear Sylvia, it read, I hope this letter finds you well. Mr. Jonas informed me on the sale of the house and that I should oversee placing your belongings into storage. As I did this, I found the old electric percolator you bought and swore by during your first year practicing in Montreal. Sylvia unwrapped the percolator. Her mother was right. She had lived by that second-hand coffee maker. No storefront Java house could satisfy the hot roasted caffeinated injection that Sylvia desperately needed. What they served her on Trumpra and cold coffee could not keep her going for more than an hour at most. Delighted by the package, which included a bag of coffee, Sylvia prepared everything and plugged the percolator in. She continued reading her mother's letter. I'll try and send more coffee your way, but it isn't easy doing it. They tell me this won't reach you for three weeks at the earliest. I suppose it's worth it if you're going to use it. Everyone misses you. Dad says to tell you the Canucks finally won. We saw Tommy yesterday. He's doing well, if you care to know. Says he's moving with Christine to Calgary. Don't be upset. He said he felt he should say goodbye. I told him that if you allowed it, he could send you correspondence. Let me know. 
No one here is blaming anybody for what happened. We're just wishing you didn't have to go to such a godforsaken place in order to find your peace of mind. You had a great position at the hospital, and for the life of me, I can't understand the choices you made. How much longer are you going to play hooky from reality? I love you, Sylvia, I really do, but you've truly confused me. The percolator had ceased doing its job. Sylvia put down the letter. Then, like countless times before, she poured herself a cup. The smell of the freshly brewed earth coffee filled her house. Its aroma went up Sylvia's nose, and for a moment she could recall St. Laurent Boulevard and the little store where she had purchased the machine. She rummaged for milk, found it, but realized she did not have any sugar. It did not matter. This was coffee, real coffee. She was content. Letting it cool off, Sylvia finished the rest of the letter. Please be safe. I've heard such awful stories about those pony things. Come home soon. Love, Mom. Sylvia dropped the paper to the table. Her mother made her crazy. Anything that woman said, did, or wrote, it did not matter what, made Sylvia red with anger. Sugarcoating it with the percolator had been clever, but low, very low. The smells coming from her cup brought Sylvia back from the dark thoughts circling inside. Finally, she took a sip. Heaven. All was right in that little house on Trumpa. All was not right, however, regarding her mother back on Earth. She wanted to write back. She wanted to pen screams of rage onto the paper. But the coffee had to be savored. Sylvia had reached an impasse. Honking came from outside. Sylvia poked her head out of the door. It was her colleague, Dr. Joseph Cummings. You have to come back to the hospital. It's Janice. She's in danger. She wants you. Won't let anyone touch her. Sylvia nodded. Leaving her coffee on the table, she scooped up her medical bag, then dashed out and into the Jeep. Were you drinking real coffee? Joseph asked. I definitely smell real coffee. All the money on Trump Rise isn't getting you any, Sylvia said, grinning. How bad is Janice? She's kicking at anyone who tries getting near. We were able to get the maid out of the room, but she's not letting up. Kind of figured she'd be this way. As they pulled up to the one floor tented building, nurses were outside waiting. Oh, Dr. Koslow once said, she's putting up an awful fuss. I'm going right in, Sylvia said. Janice's whinnying could be heard throughout the halls. When she entered the room, Sylvia saw a scared, keezy female huddled in the corner. Sweetie, she said, it's Dr. Koslow. You asked for me, remember? Baby, trouble, hurt, Janice said. Help, Dr. Koslow, please, help. Of course I'm going to help, but I need you to trust me, okay? Trust? Janice made eye contact with her, then rose up, turning around. Help, please. Will you please let Dr. Cummings give you some medicine? Janice just stared at her. It'll make you feel better. Baby, she said, help. Sylvia motioned for Joseph, who administered a pain reliever and via injection. Janice winced and sighed. Sylvia went to work. Bowels coming out backwards, she said. I'm going to have to spin it around. I'll get the kit, Joseph said. No, no time. I'm doing this the old fashioned way. She stuck her hands, then arms into Janice, who merely shook for a moment thanks to the medicine. Sylvia could feel the baby. I got it, she said. I'm turning it, turning it, and I got it. With it in the correct position, Janice began pushing. Use the handrail for more stability, Joseph said. Janice complied and pushed harder. Sylvia was ready. I see the head, she said. Keep going, Janice, you're doing fine. Out came the baby's head, then its arms and torso. Finally, its four legs and tail. It's a colt, Sylvia said. Congratulations, Janice, it's a boy. Joseph halted any nurses from touching the baby, who took several minutes longer than usual to walk. At last, he got himself up and Janice cuddled him in her arms. Thank you, doctor, she said. Baby, okay, he's safe. Sylvia smiled. She walked out of the delivery room where Joseph was waiting. Can you take me home, she asked. Of course, you all right? I'm just tired. That was pretty amazing stuff you did in there. I've only seen manual fixing and training videos. No one's ever uh, not used the kit around me. Sometimes you need to improvise when necessary. I don't remember that being in any of my med school textbooks, Joseph said, smiling. Just something my mother taught me when I was little. They got back into the Jeep and headed off. Sylvia did not speak. She touched her belly. She thought of her mother. She thought of Janice and her newborn colt. When they pulled up, Sylvia said a solemn good night to Joseph and walked inside. Her coffee, cold, was waiting for her. It did not matter if it was hot. She did not care. She needed it. Down the hatch it went, and down to responding to her mother, Sylvia went. 
with pen in hand, she wrote, hello, mother. Thank you for the percolator. It's working just fine. You can tell Tommy to go choke to death. Why you even talk to him still is beyond my comprehension. I hope he and Christine are happy with their new life together. I hope they live happily ever after. I hope they're as happy in their bed as they were in mine and Tommy's. How dare you say you don't understand me and what I did? How dare you pretend to know what went on in my head? Do you think it was easy to make such a late term decision the way I did? Tommy was gone and I was alone. You can stop sending more coffee. I don't need anything from you. You'll have to wait four more years to tell me off in person. Don't write. I don't want to hear about it. I'm doing good work here. And they're not ponies, they're centaurs. Read a book on them before you go jabbering off Sunday service gossip. Sylvia stopped writing. She looked at her coffee cup. She glanced at the percolator. Another image of Janice hovering over her newborn flashed across her eyes. Sylvia started to tear up. She would not cry though. 10 minutes and another cup of coffee passed. Sylvia reread what she had written. She had meant every word. Nothing about it made her sorry. Before she knew it though, her hands were crumbling the letter into a little ball. She took out another sheet. Dear mom, please send some Jamaican Blue Mountain next time. Love, Sylvia. Okay, I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I have answers. Well, um, thank you, Professor Tuma, for the reading. That was really great. Uh, I'm glad to do it. I'm happy to do it. Let's talk a little bit about the story uh, and get a little inside the creator's mind. Start with a simple question. Why science fiction? So these, uh, these stories, there's over a dozen of them. They were written between uh, 2000 and eight and 2011. So these are not new. These are, you know, they're almost all a decade old. And at the time I had kind of discovered uh, the works of Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Ray Bradbury, Ursula K. Le Guin. I'm sure I'm missing some other people in there, but you know, the big, you know, the big, you know, names in science fiction, in short science fiction uh, specifically. And so like on my, in, on my, in my library, I have, you know, the collected works of Clark, the collected works of Bradbury. And I always, I've always been a fan of science fiction. I've always been a fan of it. I, I can't get enough of it, whether it's, you know, books slash films like 2001 A Space Odyssey or films like Star Wars or books like The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick. Uh, you know, it, there is this idea to me of, I like the, sh depending upon the kind of science fiction, like if it's, um, you know, the, those kind of surprise endings, like you get Arthur C. Clarke does a lot of Twilight Zone-like surprise endings, and there's a few of those in, in the book as well. Uh, or there's alternate histories. I love alternate, I love the alternate histories, uh, not alternative facts, alternative histories. Uh, and that you can find in like The Man in the High Castle and there's stuff like that in there. So this book is really me kind of paying homage to the masters of science fiction who I really just, you know, can't get enough of. And, and science fiction to me, you can tackle a lot of subjects. Yes, I could have written, I, this, this story could have taken place, uh, you know, on earth. Uh, you know, my main character, Sylvia, she could have been in, you know, on, you know in, on the African continent. She could have been in Southeast Asia. She could have been in the Middle East. She could have been anywhere that wasn't North America and the story works, it's fine, you know, we get it. But it's science fiction, so I can let my imagination run wild while still tackling real life, real world issues. And in this case, it's the relationship between a mother and her daughter. And this could have been, a, you know, between a father and a son, but it was stronger, obviously, with, with the, the kind of themes I was going for. It only made sense that obviously this had to be a mother-daughter relationship. Science fiction, historically, is a great place to play with taboo topics and mm -hmm. things that are, uh, hotbed topics things that are very much on the on the mind of people and and in some ways more approachable when you deal with it in uh in genres as opposed to um in straight fiction a classic example uh, uh one that i use when i teach with my students is uh star trek the mm -hmm. original series star trek was the first interracial one of the first now debatable uh one of the first interracial kisses to happen on television in in a broadcast so uh it's the ability to bring something to people that they may not be 
assuming that they're going to have to confront in uh, within a genre piece. So how does, as writing this story, how did science fiction particularly free you to bring up some topics that may have been difficult otherwise? I'm not a medical doctor. So I have really, aside from what you can you know, see in the in, you know, on YouTube or in TV shows and movies, I have no idea what really goes on, you know, from the doctor's perspective in a, you know, when in childbirth, so I can be very vague in it, like you understand that that one scene is childbirth, but it's a centaur, so, so sure, there's a handrail, you know, so I have to kind of, you know, other than doing some deep research on birthing, I had to like, kind of like, say, okay, how would a horse do it? How would a human do it? And so that, that's one thing, but you're asking me about something else. You're asking me about the conflict between uh, between Sylvia and her mother, and 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 the conflict is her mother seeming to side with you know the ex husband Tommy, who's referenced. You know, he's cheated on his wife Sylvia, and you know she was pregnant, and they weren't together, and she had to you know she had to have uh, she chose to you know she chose to terminate the the pregnancy. And again, yes, this could have been written in a mainstream style. It could have taken place on Earth. There was no science fiction. Uh, to it, I think it becomes a little more palpable. I think it becomes uh, a little more uh, easy to digest when it's genre fiction. Uh, I don't use the word. I, I don't. I don't. I don't really say what Sylvia is talking about. I just, you know, I let, you know, I just let it be known, uh, which is fine. But I don't actually say it. I use the words, you know, a late term decision. And, you know, theoretically that could be, you know, you could read it as, you know, any way you want. The implications are obviously there. Uh, it's, a, it's a weird phenomenon where, and it's very similar to what you're talking about in terms of like Star Trek. When it's Star Trek and it's an interracial, uh, it's an interracial kiss. Yes, there were some red, you know, people were like, oh, da, da, da. Um, but for some reason, because it takes place so with that Star Trek moment, it takes place in the future. So, oh, okay, it takes place in the future. With a story like uh, Late Night Java, oh, it takes place, you know, light years, many light years away from the earth. So you could talk about these things, sure, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's that. But I think also that, that and, and to kind of go a little further with that, the idea of, yes, this is obviously the future that the short story takes place in, and they're millions of light years away from one another uh but they're still writing letters and if you notice it's pen and paper mm -hmm. it's pen and paper it's a little brown box you know it's a you know old you know newspapers in there and so we really haven't advanced that far when you really want to send somebody a, a a package but so there there's also that sense of wanting to keep things grounded in reality while also making it fantastical and you know off you know off planet mm -hmm. Uh, why centaurs? I was probably watching something that made me think of it. Um, I wanted the Kizi, the species that uh, Janisi is a, a member of, the centaur species, I wanted them to be sentient. I wanted them to not be dumb animals. The only reason why she's speaking the way she does is because she's obviously just had to learn the English, they're speaking the English, like for all I know, they could be speaking Quebecois, you know, they could be speaking whatever, she, you know, she's from, Canada, you know, she's from French Canada. Uh, they, for the purposes of my story there, it's all in English. So she's learned to speak a broken form of, you know, the human language uh, that's being spoken there. Uh, centaurs, I think I was just looking for something that was human, but not human, humanoid, but not earthling humanoid. Uh, it would take it would take away. I would have to spend some time describing them, and I wanted to be. I wanted this story to be about Sylvia. I wanted it to be about motherhood. I wanted it to be about the relationship between, uh, uh, you know, with, between child and parent. And so, centaur done. Boom. Most people are going to read this and know what a centaur is. I would hope they would read this and know what a centaur is. You know, upper body of a uh, of a human and the lower body of a of a horse, right? Um, if I had said, "Oh, a kizi is a lion human hybrid," I'd have to come up with a name for it. I'm sure Greek mythology might have a name for it, but I'd have to come up with a name for it that wasn't kizi. I'd have to come up with a description of it, and what the hell would that look like? Uh, centaur just seemed easy. 
it was just an easy plot device to, you know, to move the story forward. You get that sense of alien, uh, but you also get that sense of uh, humanity because I want you to be worried about Janice. I want, I want readers to be worried about what's going to happen. I think it's a good choice. It gets a good shorthand, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, writing in general. Okay. What, um, as you say, these most of these stories are 10 years old. Um, what would you say is good advice for uh, someone in the audience who is thinking, oh, I've always wanted to write fiction, um, always wanted to write in genre style, but uh, never, never taken the time, never tried. What's a good starting point? The one thing that somebody needs to do uh, if they want to be a writer is read. And this comes from Stephen King's Reading to Write, a, short, uh, a shortened essay of a, of a larger, uh, of his larger book. I think it's his memoir, could be wrong, but it's- On writing. The, the, yep. On writing, yeah. So yep. this comes from On Writing, thank you. This comes from Stephen King's On Writing. The best writers are the best readers. And you can't say, I'm gonna go write a science fiction novel, or I'm gonna go and write a science fiction short story. Or, I'm gonna write a Western, or, I'm gonna write a romance. If you tell me, that you're going to embark upon this uh, plan to write science fiction. And I ask you, who are your influences? And you tell me, I don't have any, I don't have time to read science fiction. Then you're not going to be able to write science fiction. There's no, it's not going to happen. Uh, you need to know as a writer, you need to know what has come before you. Uh, you need to have a basic understanding of what's happening at the moment in the genre. Doesn't have to be. You you need to be. I think you need to be a, a very much aware of the of the foundation and the past that has come before, uh, and to be kind of cognizant of what's going on. You know, contemporary to you. Uh, and if you don't have that, then you're going to be a, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Same thing with any genre. You know, even with mainstream fiction, you have to read the mainstream stuff in order to write mainstream fiction. Same thing, with, but that's with anything. You know, you wanna be a biographer, you better start reading some biographies. Uh, you know, it's all, it's all intertwined. It's like with, uh, with filmmaking, right? You and I both work and also in documentary. You know, you tell me, if, you know, you're working on a documentary and I ask you, uh, who are your documentarian influences? And you go, oh, I don't have time for that. I'm gonna laugh at you and just know that it's gonna be a disaster. I know for a fact who your influences are, I know some of them. So I know that you're in, you know, you're doing just fine. Uh, but the point is, is that you need to have this, this, this body of influence. It can be, it can be one, one person should be a, maybe a handful just so you get, you get variety doing a little homework, uh, practice makes perfect. I know that's a very cliche saying, but it's true. Practice makes perfect. Don't be intimidated and don't be afraid. Um, even 10 years ago, it was so hard to get your work out there, but if you want to be a writer, don't be obsessed with making a living doing it. 1% of writers get to do it for a living, okay? Not everybody gets to be Stephen King and not everybody gets to be J.K. Rowling. If only, if only I could, you know, if only we could do the things we really are passionate about and make, you know, do that for a living, that would be a perfect world, but we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, but there are many print publications that you can find. There are many websites and it's not like it used to be. People don't, people are not going to scoff at you when you say you've had your work published digitally. Amazon offers media on demand. It offers print on demand. You can get your work out there to get it out there. And I have no shame in it. This was independently published by me via Amazon. I just happen to know how to put a book, you know, I, you know, you need to know what you're doing, you know, to put a book together. Uh, but you have many avenues if you want the bottom line because I've, I've rambled a bit but bottom line is if you want to be a writer you need to read and you need to write ideally you write every day and i'm paraphrasing stephen king on right you know you have to write every day you have to read every day you have your day job right your day job but if you are passionate about something be it writing be it filmmaking be it dance be it singing musical instrument you have to make the time uh, in your day to dedicate towards getting better at it every day. Don't be afraid to get rejected. You, you're going to get 99 no's, but that one yes is going to feel so good. That's great advice. Yeah. I mean, and I think a lot of authors will tell you that uh, if it's a, a, a fact of 
waking up an hour earlier every day to give yourself time uh, or finding a way to stay up maybe an hour later at night after, of course, after your homework's done, guys. After but, your um, homework is done, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Schoolwork, schoolwork first, kids yep. and adults. But make you make time. Um, I was actually, that was actually my last question was, tell me about uh, how you got published. So is this is self-publishing um, and you went through Amazon service. Mm -hmm. Was that a complicated? It's only complicated if you don't know what you're doing. So I don't recommend somebody doing it and thinking they can get it done on their first try. You know, again, you want to be able to, uh, you know, publish this through Amazon yourself. Um, you have to know what you're doing. And Amazon provides everything that you need in terms of learning how to do it. You have to pick the font. The type, of, the type of font, you have to pick the size, you have to pick the pagination, the margins, you have to find an artist, Najee R. Smith, an alum of Essex County College, Najee is the artist, nice. God bless him, he's the best, he works with me on my documentaries, uh, Najee I commissioned to do, to do that for me, um, there is a process, but if you go to Amazon and you look up some of these books that have been independently published via the Amazon services, um, you're going to see that there are some people who know what they're doing. You're going to see some people who don't know what the hell they're doing. But if you want people to read your work and it's something that you are passionate about and you don't know that if traditional publishing is where you can do it, yeah, you have, you have that service. And it costs you, theoretically, Amazon charges you nothing. They will sell the book for you. They print it for you. They ship it for you. You get a royalty. It's a pretty good deal. I'm a big fan. Yeah. That's how I distribute that book. That's how I distribute this. It's also how I distribute the DVDs to my documentaries. It's all through Amazon. Amazon figured it out. They were ahead of the curve. Uh, we are not in any way sponsored by Amazon. Um, just going to put that out there for our public access viewers. But um, a good service there are is many, worth there, talking about. Yeah, there are several, there are several independent publishing uh services out there i happen to use amazon maybe it's a good solution for you guys when you have your stories ready so uh professor Tuma, anything else you'd like to let the audience know about um your work and writing in general when i i was 10 years old i'm 36 i was 10 years old and in fifth grade when i said i wanted to be a writer and not everybody gets to you know figure that out early on so if you're you know if you're younger than me or you're my age or you're older than me and you and you have that itch to tell a story, don't wait. Right. Um, one of the best ways to get started is to keep just a little notebook with you. Technically, you could do it on your phones, date it, write the ideas as they come to you, and then figure it out later. That's the one of the things I did to this day. I am not far away from a notebook. If you know, obviously I'm in the house right now, but you know, when I'm on campus, uh, you know, I have my bag with me and the notebook is in there with me just, you know, just in case. Professor Toom, I want to thank you for all your great advice and for sharing your wonderful story with us all today. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Take care. Bye.